This is the second video discussing the concept of the arrow of time. In the first part, I had covered the historical aspects and provide an overview of the types of arrows of time. Link in the description. Now, in the second part, I delve into a more detailed exploration of the arrows of time. The different arrows of time are thermodynamic arrow of time, psychological arrow of time, cosmological arrow of time, quantum arrow of time, particle physics weak arrow of time, radiative arrow of time, and causal arrow of time. What's really intriguing is that these all arrows of time usually point in the same direction. This alignment isn't a coincidence. Stephen Hawking suggests that the no-boundary condition for the universe and the weak anthropic principle can help explain why these arrows align. The no-boundary condition is a hypothesis that suggests the universe has no distinct boundary or edge in space-time. Instead, it's a closed, finite, and smooth entity without a true beginning or end. And the weak anthropic principle is a concept that says that the reason the universe seems just right for life is because we are here to notice it. It's like looking around and thinking, the universe must be this way because otherwise, we wouldn't be here to see it. This principle doesn't necessarily mean the universe was designed for us, but it points out that we can only exist in a universe that supports life. It's a way of explaining why things in the universe seem to work well for us. The argument is that for intelligent beings like us to exist and ask questions about the nature of time, these arrows need to be consistent. He also suggests that the thermodynamic arrow of time, the way we perceive time, and the cosmic expansion of the universe all need to work together in order for life to develop and for us to ponder these deep questions. So, the alignment of these arrows of time is a profound aspect of the universe and it's tied to both fundamental physics and the conditions required for life to emerge and evolve. Let's delve into the thermodynamic arrow of time. The term thermodynamic can be dissected into its components. Thermo refers to the study of heat, energy transfer, and thermal processes. Dynamics refers to the examination of how heat, energy, and matter interact and change within physical systems. The second law of thermodynamics and the concept of entropy are fundamental to understanding the thermodynamic arrow of time. The second law of thermodynamics is a crucial principle in physics, and it's closely tied to the concept of entropy. Entropy is a measure of the disorder or randomness in a system. A room getting messier and more disordered over time is a practical example of entropy. The second law states that in any closed system, the total entropy tends to increase or remains constant in any spontaneous process. It never decreases over time. In other words, things naturally become more disordered as time goes on. The level of entropy in a system tends to be lower in the past compared to its current state and is expected to increase even further in the future. This suggests that yesterday had lower entropy than today and today has lower entropy than tomorrow. There are several reasons why entropy increases and not decreases. Some of the main reasons are statistical probability, irreversibility, the second law of thermodynamics, energy transfer, etc. To illustrate entropy, let's use the example of a jigsaw puzzle. Imagine you have all the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle in a box. There's only one specific arrangement of these pieces that creates a complete picture. This arrangement represents a state of order. However, there are countless ways the pieces can be arranged randomly without forming a coherent picture. These random arrangements represent states of disorder. The key idea here is that there are far more possible arrangements that result in disorder than there are arrangements that result in order. When you leave a system to itself over time, it's much more likely to transition to a higher entropy state becoming more disordered than to a lower entropy state becoming more ordered. This natural tendency towards increasing disorder is what gives rise to the thermodynamic arrow of time. It's why we don't see broken cups spontaneously reassembling themselves or scrambled eggs unscrambling on their own. The second law of thermodynamics guides the way processes happen in our universe and is a significant factor in shaping the direction of time. You start with a system that's in an ordered state, like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle forming a complete picture in a box. If you shake the box, the pieces will likely move into a disordered arrangement where they don't form a proper picture. This is because there are many more ways for the pieces to be disordered than there are ways for them to be ordered. Similarly, this concept extends analogously to the universe. 
However, if God decides that the universe is supposed to end up in a highly ordered state, things get interesting. It didn't matter how disordered it was initially. If the universe began in a disordered state, then disorder would decrease with time. This means that broken cups would seemingly mend and scrambled eggs wouldn't scramble on their own. The crucial condition here is that any intelligent being observing the cups would be living in a universe in which disorder decreased with time. If there were intelligent beings like us observing this universe, they would experience a psychological arrow of time that was opposite to ours. They would remember events in the future and forget events in the past. It means that when the cup was broken and then fixed, they'd remember the cup being whole on the table, but not remember it being broken on the floor. Let's use this thought experiment to make things super clear. Imagine a cup, let's call it a red cup placed on a table. From our usual point of view, the red cup on the table represents the present. But when it accidentally breaks into pieces, the red cup on the table becomes a reminder of past events because it has already shattered. We couldn't predict that the cup would break while it was still on the table, as whether it would break or not remains in the future for us. In simple terms, we can remember things that have already happened, which is the past, and things that are happening right now, which is the present. But we can't remember things that will happen in the future. Now, let's explore what would occur in a universe where time runs backward. Let's assume that in this universe, objects change color when they break. When the cup is not broken, it's red. If it breaks, the broken pieces turn white. And if the white pieces are mended, they change into blue. Imagine the intelligent beings of this universe seeing a red cup on a table in the present. These beings possess knowledge of the future, foreseeing that the red cup will fall and shatter into white pieces. They also anticipate that these white cup fragments will spontaneously mend themselves, transforming into a new blue cup. As the red cup falls, breaks, and changes to blue, they forget the initial presence of the red cup on the table because it has become part of their past. However, they do perceive the broken cup pieces, as this is a current event within their present. They can also foresee the mending of the white cup pieces into a blue cup because they possess knowledge of their future. When the white cup fragments mend and return to a blue cup, they had forgotten the entire sequence of events from the red cup breaking to its transformation into white pieces and then blue. For them, the only recollection is of a blue cup on the table, and they have no memory of the whole journey of the red cup breaking into white pieces, mending, and turning blue. This unique perspective challenges their perception of the past and the way they remember events. So, in their perspective, they simply forget that the red cup broke and got fixed, and they only remember the blue cup being on the table. What happened yesterday for them is like what will happen tomorrow for us. This thought experiment challenges our usual understanding of time's direction and how we remember events. It illustrates how the alignment of the initial conditions and the behavior of the universe can impact the way time seems to flow for intelligent observers within that universe. The existence of the thermodynamic arrow of time raises questions about its origin and significance. Why should the thermodynamic arrow of time exist at all? Or, in other words, why should the universe be in a state of high order at one end of time, the end that we call the past? Why is it not in a state of complete disorder at all times? After all, this might seem more probable. And why is the direction of time in which disorder increases the same as that in which the universe expands? The explanation for this phenomenon is provided by the cosmological arrow of time, this arrow of time is related to the large-scale properties of the universe. It's connected to the expansion of the universe and the fact that it began in a highly ordered state, the Big Bang. The cosmological arrow of time points in the direction of the universe's expansion, going from the past, the Big Bang, to the future, the continued expansion. The cosmological arrow of time and the thermodynamic arrow of time are interconnected because the expansion of the universe affects the thermodynamic processes within it. As the universe expands, it becomes less dense, and thermodynamic processes like heat transfer and entropy increase. The interrelationship between cosmology and thermodynamics represents an intriguing facet of the exploration of time within the realm of physics. In the classical theory of general relativity, we can't figure out how the universe started. This is because our usual scientific rules stop working when we get to the very beginning, a point we call the Big Bang Singularity. 
Consequently, it becomes impossible to precisely determine how the universe began using the existing framework. This ambiguity leaves room for two distinct possibilities. The universe could have started in a smooth and orderly state. This scenario would result in clearly defined thermodynamic and cosmological arrows of time, mirroring what we observe in reality. Alternatively, the universe might have originated in a lumpy and disordered state. In this case, the universe would already be in a state of complete disorder, so disorder could not increase with time. It would either remain constant, leading to no well-defined arrow of time, or decrease, leading to a thermodynamic arrow of time opposite to the cosmological arrow. These possibilities don't agree with our observations. However, it's important to note that classical general relativity reaches its limits as the curvature of space-time becomes significant. At this point, quantum gravitational effects gain prominence, rendering classical theory inadequate to describe the universe. To truly understand how the universe began, a quantum theory of gravity becomes necessary, as this theory would integrate quantum mechanics with gravitational principles. This insight highlights the need to incorporate quantum considerations to explore the universe's initial conditions more accurately. In the quantum theory of gravity, which combines our understanding of how things are very small and how gravity works, there's a way to think about how the universe might have started. Instead of needing to say exactly how things were at the very beginning, we can use what's called the no-boundary condition. This means that the universe has a starting point, often associated with the Big Bang, but it's smooth and doesn't have any boundaries, edges, or singularities. At this beginning point, the universe would have begun expanding in a smooth and orderly way. It couldn't have been completely all over, though, because of the rules of quantum theory, mainly the uncertainty principle. So, there would have been tiny differences in how things were spread out. At the start of the universe, there were small differences in the amount of stuff and the speeds of particles. The idea of the no-boundary condition suggests that these differences were incredibly tiny, just like the uncertainty principle predicts. The universe's beginning involved a period of exponential expansion called inflation, where it grew much larger. As the universe expanded during this inflationary phase, the initial small differences in density didn't change much at first, but as time went on, these differences started getting bigger. As the universe expanded, these differences in density would grow. Places where there was a bit more stuff would slow down in their expansion due to gravity, and over time, these spots would turn into galaxies, stars, and eventually, us. The universe would have started in a smooth and ordered state, and would have become lumpy and disordered as time went on. This would explain the existence of the thermodynamic arrow of time. This process explains why we see time as moving in a particular direction. But what about if the universe stopped expanding and started shrinking? Would time start moving backward, and would things become more ordered? This part gets a bit more speculative. If the universe contracted and disorder decreased, we might see some strange things, like broken cups fixing themselves or knowing future events. However, the universe won't start contracting for at least another 10,000 million years, so we don't need to worry about that right now. But there is a quicker way to find out what will happen when the universe contracts and disorder decreases by jumping into a black hole. When a star collapses to become a black hole, it's a bit like what might happen when the whole universe collapses. If disorder were to decrease when the universe shrinks, we might expect the same inside a black hole. But unfortunately, if you were an astronaut falling into a black hole, you wouldn't have time to take advantage of this or tell anyone about it. The intense gravity would stretch you into spaghetti and trap you inside. Stephen Hawking's ideas shed light on this topic. Initially, he believed that as the universe contracted, disorder would decrease. This assumption stemmed from his view that the universe would return to a smooth and orderly state as it shrank. This concept implied that the contracting phase would mirror the expansion phase in reverse. This intriguing notion envisioned people experiencing life backward in the contracting phase, dying before being born, and getting younger, as the universe shrank. This idea seemed appealing due to its symmetry between expansion and contraction. However, Hawking later realized that he couldn't hold on to this idea without further support. The crucial question was whether the no-boundary condition supported or contradicted this notion.
He was initially influenced by an analogy with the Earth's surface. Linking the universe's start to the North Pole and its end to the South Pole seemed analogous. But he emphasized that these poles relate to the universe's beginning and end in imaginary time, not real time. The beginning and end of real time can be very different from each other. Additionally, Hawking had worked on a straightforward model of the universe, where the collapse phase mirrored the expansion phase in reverse. His colleague, Don Page, pointed out that the no-boundary condition didn't necessarily demand this symmetry. Moreover, his student Raymond Laflamme's work revealed that in a more intricate model, the collapse of the universe differed markedly from its expansion. Ultimately, Hawking came to a new realization. The no-boundary condition indicated that disorder would continue to increase during the universe's contraction. This conclusion suggested that the arrows of time, both in terms of thermodynamics and the psychological arrow of time, wouldn't reverse when the universe started contracting, or even within black holes. While the idea of time moving backward during contraction was intriguing, it didn't align with the evidence and deeper insights gained through his research. Unlike the physical arrows of time like cosmological and thermodynamic, which are based on objective scientific principles, the psychological arrow of time is rooted in how individuals perceive the flow of time. The psychological arrow of time refers to the subjective experience of time passing. It is intricately tied to the thermodynamic arrow of time. Our brains align our sense of time with the direction in which entropy increases. So, disorder increases with time because we measure time in the direction in which disorder increases. This subjective sense of time passing is influenced by various factors, including memory, consciousness, and the way our minds process and organize events. Memory is a crucial factor in our perception of time. We remember past events, and this forms our sense of the past. The way we recall and store memories can influence our perception of time. For example, significant or emotionally charged events tend to be remembered more vividly and time may seem to pass more slowly during such events. Our state of consciousness also plays an important role in how we perceive time. When we are completely immersed in an activity or experiencing a state of flow, time often seems to pass swiftly. On the other hand, during periods of boredom or waiting, time may seem to drag on. The psychological arrow of time is also centered on the subjective experience of time by individuals. It's about how we perceive the flow of time in our daily lives and how our minds organize events into a sequence of past, present, and future. Our minds naturally organize events in chronological order, creating a sense of the past, present, and future. This organization allows us to make sense of our experiences and plan for the future. The psychological perception of time is not constant. It can be influenced by various factors, it is all about how humans subjectively experience and perceive the passage of time. It's a complex and multifaceted aspect of our consciousness and cognition, influenced by memory, consciousness, and emotional factors.